You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again for any of you Tuesday here on the old network. That means it is time for Options Insider Radio, the interview program here where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and proceed to Pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, on the aforementioned network, reminding you wherever you get our content, there's a slew of it hitting you pretty much multiple times a day these days, close to a dozen programs cranking away on the network these days. If you like this or any of the programs we do, keep rating and reviewing it in your platform of choice. These days, it's more important than ever. There's a slew of new listeners, a slew of new entrants to the markets all the time. They need a place to turn. In these troubled waters, we will be their lighthouse. So keep rating and reviewing. Really does help the new entrants to this space find their way to our door. Even though we've been cranking away for, God, over 14 years now, which is sounds crazy when you say it out loud. But there's always new people, and they need a place to turn. So keep rating and reviewing. Keep those questions and comments coming, too. Maybe you have a guest you'd like to see here on the Options Insider radio program. Reach out to us. Hit us up. We'd do love to hear from all of you out there. Let's see who we're hearing from. On the program today, I am joined by a newcomer to the program and indeed to the network. He is Wayne Ferbert, the Managing Director at Alpha DNA Investment Management. Wayne, welcome to the Options Insider Radio Program. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mark. Uh, you know, I've been in, running into this option space for uh, you know over a decade now, and uh, I'm excited to finally get on your show. Well, now you've made it. You've made it onto the network, right. so now you are official, Wayne. <laughs> All right. But since this is your first time here on the program and indeed on the network, why don't you go ahead and give our audience a bit of an overview of your background in the options space as well as what it is you do at Alpha DNA? Yeah, so I really uh, got into the options space because I headed product development at TD Ameritrade, right? And uh, way back in the day, we definitely saw options as a – you know the a huge part of the future growth of online brokerage and as a great potential for clients to be able to specifically create the exact exposure they may want to equities or ETFs through the use of options. And so we made it a real priority. We built a lot of great tools while I was there running that, uh, running that group. And then uh, I actually moved over to run business development and mergers and acquisitions. And, and I was running mergers and acquisitions when we acquired Thinkorswim, which I'm sure a lot of your audience is familiar with Thinkorswim uh, in the option space. Tom Sosnoff and his group there in Chicago and the, and the great platform that they built. 
uh, that Ameritrade acquired, and and you know we further expanded uh, our options capabilities. I left and wrote a book called Buy and Hedge, all about how to use options to defend the downside uh, risks in your portfolio, and uh, that launched me into investment management. Uh, we we launched an investment manager that's grown to over 400 million in assets under management called Zega Financial, and along the way. We met some researchers that just had an intriguing idea around uh, uh, how to build a better equity portfolio. And with my experience around how to better defend an equity portfolio, we combined those together to make Alpha DNA Investment Management. So I left the firm Zega and and uh, started pursuing this Alpha DNA Investment Management full time back in 2017. And uh, we had actually been been incubating these strategies as part of Zega from 2014. And so now basically what we're doing in Alpha DNA is uh, we're building hedged equity strategies. So we have long equity positions and then we build uh, index hedges to defend the downside. But the what really sets us apart is the uh, equity portfolio that we build. It's, it's built uh, on one uh, really important research factor, which is finding companies that have hidden demand, demand that Wall Street hasn't quite caught up to yet. And we find that demand through a, a very advanced implementation of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and alternative data sources. And that's really, you know, to me, you know, I feel like I was very lucky to be on the on the leading edge of how options were being adopted uh, in the marketplace through TD Ameritrade and my exposure to Thinkorswim and and all those groups. And now I think machine learning is going to have a similar effect on the world of investing. And I'm glad that I'm on the, the leading edge of that now too. Oh, a lot to unpack there. I'm going to get into everything you just mentioned about the ETF and the hedging and all that fun stuff. Before we do that, you mentioned your book. It was pretty popular back in the day, sold a few copies out there. So some of our audience may be familiar with it, but I'm sure a lot of the newcomers probably aren't. Let's do an overview because I think that will give us some idea of the genesis, the origins of the techniques, the approaches you're using with this ETF. So hit us really quick. What are your five iron rules and how do you figure your hedging and option strategies into that? Yeah. So the five iron rules, uh, you know, we're all about, you know, how to defend the downside of your portfolio. Right. Um, they've ch- they've kind of changed over time. But if you read the book, you'll still get a lot of value out of it. Really, buy and hedge. If you see the book's title, you'll see it says buy and hold. The hold is scratched out. Right. Uh, and because and, it's meant to say buy and hold is sort of this dying uh, uh, sort of approach investing. You've got to be actively managing your downside risk. And and so that is really ultimately what the book is about, is always being invested while always being hedged, right? Uh, And so Buy and Hedge was published by the Pearson Group. You might remember the little penguins on the back of your textbooks uh, in college, right? Same company. Um, If you read the book, you're going to find that, you know, we're we're, we're very interested in things like married puts, right? or, uh, uh, you know, techniques where, you know, we're straddling the stock or techniques in which, you know, we have a covered call and arrow in the, uh, the return profile that your particular stock or your index uh, uh, might expose you to. Right. And we walk you through all the techniques for building that. We even walk you through some techniques that back then, I don't think when we wrote this book over 10 years ago, people didn't talk so much about the concept of a buffered strategy. But some of the strategies that, that we've promoted over the years to the book. We're, we're sort of precursors to the buffered strategies that are popular now, which is to say, you know, your protection kicks in at some level, maybe 10 percent below where the market is. And it, and it, and it protects you for, they say, the next 10 or 15 percent of downside. But then the your, your you know, uh, but then the protection stops and your losses would continue again if the markets actually were to proceed all the way 25 percent down or more. So, uh, you know, it is uh, uh, the, the ultimately what you got to care the most about. Right. Uh, with, with our approach is being always invested, but being always hedged. Always ask yourself, you know, do you have uh, the proper protection in place, right, uh, for your particular portfolio? Well, I can guarantee very few people talk about hedged equity these days, even. So over a decade ago, Wayne, uh, I'm, I'm certain you were one of the few out there, certainly in the book realm, <laughs> talking about this stuff. Let's get into what you're working on now. Of course, you mentioned it. This new ETF sounds like an interesting partnership you have going on there, diving into the world of machine learning, using machine learning to effectively determine equity sentiment. That's what you have. You have an equity sentiment ETF. Then you combine what you were just talking about, the hedging strategy. So 
audience likes to get into the weeds, Wayne. I guess first, let's start with the underlying, how you're using machine learning to really determine, like you mentioned, this, this hidden demand, to find these diamonds in the rough, and then what option strategies are you applying on top of that? Yeah, so like you mentioned, our ETF does have the word sentiment in it. The ticker symbol is SCNT from Advisor Shares. And that is because we are measuring uh, uh, the, the sentiment, both the Wall Street analyst sentiment and then what we often refer to as the digital sentiment of underlying customers and consumers to the companies that they're interacting with, right? So hedge de- we are a hedged equity strategy, and the hedged equity implies two parts, right? You have an equity part and you have a hedge part. So like you said, let's focus on the equity part first. We are building it using machine learning. Um, we are trying to identify companies that are growing faster than the Wall Street analysts currently are forecasting that they're growing, right? The current assumption being that the stock price today of any stock reflects collectively what all of the Wall Street analysts uh, uh, believe the stock that the company is growing by, right? That it's growing its revenue and its EPS by a certain amount. It's achieving a certain amount of traction in its, in its particular competitive landscape. And as a result, it's you know the, the Wall Street analysts might be forecasting 4%. We're looking for chances in which Everything we review about the company says, no, no, we think that company is growing by more. We think it's growing by eight or nine percent. And if we're right, then that company is going to be rewarded with more buyers. Right. More people are going to want to buy into that stock, because if the current price reflects what Wall Street thinks at four percent and it actually ends up being eight or nine percent, that company will be rewarded. I don't think anyone would sort of dispute the whole concept, the, the whole investment concept that if you can find companies that are selling more widgets than everyone thinks they're selling, they're likely going to go up in price, right? Um, as soon as the rest of the world finds it out, and that's what we've designed. And the way we have our the, the, the real advantage that we've built is it's not only the machine learning, which is obviously complicated to work with, and you've got to have a team of data scientists that that are able to to code for that, but it's actually the data that we collect. You know, we basically collect the digital footprint and have been collecting the digital footprint of the of nearly the entire Russell three thousand of all the companies in the Russell 3000 since 2011. And by digital footprint, I mean the web traffic, the search results, the, the uh, for key brands associated with the company, uh, the app usage, app downloads, the social media uh, mentions, tweets, retweets, follows, unfollows, right? Um, all, of, all of that data collectively represents the digital footprint I'm talking about, the actual consumer metrics and consumer volume metrics of actual interaction between customers and the digital identities. That is a really good proxy for how much people currently sort of like that company's product and are using that company's product. And we basically train the machine learning to turn all of the changes in that data into a forecast model for the companies, right? And then we compare that forecast model to what Wall Street thinks. That's what gets us, that's what helps us find companies we want to buy, right? Is to just say, you know, if Wall Street thinks they're growing at 4%, we think they're growing at 9%, that's a buying opportunity. So we just build a portfolio of, you know, in the ETF, for instance, of 90 to 100 stocks, equal weight, that we think represent the best 90 to 100 opportunities to surprise Wall Street with their forward performance. Right, so that's the underlying, that's the sentiment portion of it. Now, a lot of our audience obviously coming to the door also for the hedging, the hedged equity components of this ETF. So walk us through that. How do you structure the hedged components of this ETF? So, so the portfolio is about 40% large cap and about 60% mid and small cap, right? And so we build a hedge using both the SPY and the IWM. So the SPY is the S&P 500 ETF, you know, the largest, most liquid ETF in the world. The IWM is an ETF on the Russell 2000, right? Uh, the small cap index, so that there's some mid cap stocks in there as well. Uh, and, and the IWM is the largest ETF version of the Russell 2000, right? They both have very liquid options markets. And so we regularly buy long puts. We basically run a Delta hedging program. Your listeners will be familiar with with anything, uh, with with that sort of a description of a hedging program. We're looking to buy hedges on both the S&P 500 ETF and the Russell 2000 ETF at around 120 days from expiration. And we look to roll them with about 60 days to go, which means we're resetting the hedge six times a year that's a very sensitive approach to hedging, right? I mean, you're, you're, to have your hedge reset based on how markets go up and down six times a year is going to make it very sensitive to the outcomes of the market, right? It's around a 30 delta hedging program. Uh, so it's out of the money when we buy them, but 30 delta is on that inflection point, right? I mean, 30 delta, if the markets tend to move up or down violently from an entry at around 30 delta, 
you're going to you're going to see a real change in the delta pretty quickly, particularly if the markets go down. That negative 30 delta, right, of the put is going to accelerate to the you know, minus 50 pretty quickly. And then we look for opportunities to take profits in the hedges. You know, I always tell people, if you're in a hedged equity strategy, uh, you better have a hedged equity manager that takes profits from the hedges when they're presented, when when hedges go in the money, right? Uh, because otherwise you're just in a low volatility strategy. You're just going to ride the hedge up and down as the market goes up and down. And, and it's just going to cost you money over time. It's going to cost you theta, right? It's going to cost you time value. And that's not what we want here, right? We want to make sure you get profits. And when you get those profits, that's because the markets are down. You reinvest those profits in the stocks that we like, the stocks that I just told you about, the, the ones that are creating the hidden demand. And so uh, that hedging program, it's you know very sensitive, rolled regularly, way more sensitive than the average hedged equity program. And historically, the reason this has worked for us, Mark, is the equity portfolio has produced enough alpha, right, enough excess return to pay for the cost of the hedges. And that's really what's helped set us apart in the hedged equity space. Wow, you, you automatically got to my next question, which is, of course, when the time anyone asks about hedging, the next question is, of course, how are you going to pay for it, right? Because the, the traditional concept of hedging is that it's a fairly substantial drag on your portfolio. Traditional S&P, roughly 5% out of the money put, going to cost you somewhere around 8 plus percent a year if you keep doing it every few months out there. So that's obviously a, a big concern to a lot of people. You're not utilizing any sort of income component. There. You're not going the collar strategy. You're not going the put spread strategy. You're not going ratio put spread. You're not doing collar with the put spread. None of those. It's all the underlying that's paying for the, the cost of the put wing. Yeah, so so I think that's one of the things that really sets us apart in the space is if you looked in the hedge equity space, you know, ninety percent of the players in this space do some sort of options tactical strategy to help pay for the cost of the hedge. Or at least I examined, I read the prospectus of all ninety of the largest mutual funds in the hedge equity space uh, that have been around at least five years, and they all, uh, like I said, ninety percent of them do some sort of tactical. You know, they sell calls or they sell puts and. Frequently, they're, they're, they've got the put spread calendar. And so the near put, in a near month, they'll be shorter put. In the long month, they'll be longer put. That's the protection. But oftentimes, the short put in the near month is actually closer to the money than the long put in the outdated month, which means in a violent down market, you're going to actually experience a worse outcome for your clients, right? And what we find in our examination of the patch equity space is for most of those, most of the players that do that, that options premium selling does not add value. And it's not that you can't do well selling options premium. It's just experience tells us it's really difficult to consistently do it well across an index. It's easier to do it well across individual stocks, particularly just because of the sort of uh, asymmetric nature of the payoff of uh, options on individual stocks versus you know, indexes, which then have lower volatility, right? And so um, we we step up and we say we put all of our effort not into trying to figure out how to sell you calls and puts to pay for it that might actually change the risk profile of the strategy, but instead we just you know put it all the effort into can we select better stocks right? Can our AI and our data and and our uh, the data that we analyze produce better stock picks that help pay for it? And and again, it's, like I said, it's not to say that selling calls and puts is not a valid way uh, to create income to to pay for any strategy. It's just historically, when you look at the managers in the space, they haven't been that good at it. And so it's got it's to make you question, you know, why that doesn't work. No, you're right. That is a big problem with these types of approaches that people typically spend a lot of their time focusing on how to pay for that protection. And then you're right. When we see an aggressive sell off, like let's say last March, the performance isn't the best because they're short a whole bunch of near term gamma that blows up in their faces. And it's opposed to the longer term hedge they have, which obviously isn't kicking in as aggressively as the stuff they sold to pay for it. So you're right. It's, it's a difficult dance to do out there, which is, it's just interesting. And of course, it also puts a, a large burden then on your underlying there, Wayne, to have to, to carry that cost and be able to absorb, absorb the puts and keep rolling. So how has the performance been so far out there with Scent? Yeah, so Scent uh, only launched in the first week of February. So, uh, you know, it's... So for a whopping month, how's it doing? <laughs> well, and, and, and it's a month in which the, you know, the markets are, you know, relatively flat. And, you know, so are we. So, but realize we're paying for a hedge in that window too. And so we've been able to pay for a hedge and still keep up uh, most of the market. Now, the market's been very divergent over that month, meaning 
you know, the, the NASDAQ, the S&P, the Russell 2000, all the Dow, right, all have very divergent performance over that window, right? So, so we're basically flat. Uh, the market's flat over the same window, right? Uh, you know, like, like the S- S&P's up a couple of points. The, 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 the NASDAQ's down a couple, right, um, over that same window. Uh, the Russell's, I think, up a little bit over that window, right? Um, or actually the Russell's now flat because because of the last because of this last week. We have exposure to all of those indices effectively in terms of the stock selection, right? And we're flat, but we're flat and we've managed to pay for our hedge, right? So the thing we always say to people is if I could what if, if I could just create enough alpha to just pay for the hedge and help you keep up with the index, I think you'd be very happy because the average hedge equity strategy only delivers around 50 to 60 percent capture ratio of the return of the underlying S&P 500, right? And here, our experience with our separate managed accounts, which is the basis of the ETF, has been our average capture ratio for the last three plus years of running hedged equity has been over over 100%, meaning we create more than enough alpha historically with our stock selection to pay for the cost of the hedge. Now, like I said, we've only been live for six weeks here, so we've got, you know, this has still got, these stocks still have some room to work themselves out, uh, but, you know, we tend to lean into growth uh, because remember I told you earlier, you're trying to find companies that uh, the market thinks they're growing by 4%. We think they're growing by 8%. You're going to have a bias towards growth oriented companies. Well, growth over the last six weeks that the since line has launched is actually negative, right? So our ability to be flat, we feel pretty good about. And you mentioned something that caught my attention earlier, which is, you know, a problem we've seen many times on our network. We do a lot of unusual activity and other things like that. Whenever you have a long premium position, you need to take it off (laughs) at some point in order to capture the profits. Otherwise, you're right. As you mentioned, you're kind of just going to ride it all the way down back to zero as it erodes against you. So you mentioned you have to take off your put at an opportune time. What are some of your rules? You mentioned going in the money. Is that your rule? Do you take it off then? Do you take off a portion? How do you make sure you take off the put effectively to capture it, but also give yourself a little bit of, of run room on the downside in case things keep moving? Yeah. So the most important rule is, you know, around expiration or sorry, uh, you know, around the traditional monthly expiration, right? So the, the you know, third Friday of the month, um, we're going to be looking to reset any option that is down to 60 days or two months to expiration, right? Meaning, and like I said earlier, we're going to buy 120 days out the long put, and we're going to look to roll it with 60 days to go. That's rule one. And that always occurs no matter what, right? So, so sorry, sorry. That's sort of the underlying approach that we're going to take, right? Um, however, if in that interim window, the markets go up a lot or go down a lot or the index at the hedge, in other words, is built against goes up a lot or goes down a lot. Well, then we're going to want to make sure that our hedge is still effective. So let's say the market goes up a lot and our delta gets down below 15. If it gets below 15, it depends on how far out of the money. I'm sorry, how many more days it has uh, before expiration. It'll get rolled early, right? Uh, if it goes below 15 and we're close to the roll date anyway, it'll get rolled. If it goes all the way to 10 and you're still far enough away, um, it'll also get rolled, right? So there's sort of a scale between 10 and 15 delta that would cause us to roll early. But that's because the market has moved up. Likely our stock portfolio has moved up. And so now the protection is much further out of the money. We want to look our clients in the eye and say, you're protected. And so we're going to roll that hedge early, right? But we're again going to roll it to something that's around 120 days out with the expectation to roll 60 to go. On the other side, if the markets go down precipitously and therefore the delta goes, or the, the option goes in the money, therefore the delta goes below below negative 50, right? So it's, or, you know, so it's, it's getting down into minus five, five or minus 60 delta. Uh, then we're going to look for the chance to roll it in that sense as well. And what we'll do is we'll put a trailing stop on the market, right? If the market ke- it keeps going down, we'll keep riding the, op- the option uh, increase in the option value as the delta tends to accelerate, but then once it reaches a, 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 a certain step and then it, the market rebounds a certain percentage, that's the whole point of a trailing stop, right? Uh, then we'll harvest that hedge and we'll roll to a new lower hedge. Uh, so we'll roll out of the money. We'll basically put new risk in the portfolio. And then, but with all that profit from that hedge, we'll buy more stocks with it, right? And you, a, a really good hedging program emerges on the other side of a decline like we had in first quarter last year with more stocks than they went into it, right? Because you use the profits from those hedges. 
You just got to have the courage to roll those hedges down and realize when you buy those new hedges, when you roll down, volatility is going to be high because, you know, the market's gone down precipitously if your hedges have gone all the way from a 25 to 30 delta into an in the money position, right? You just got to have the courage to do it, roll down and take your profits and then reinvest in the markets with those profits. Interesting. So it's all Delta based, the adjustment. There's no premium component or anything else like that. It's all Delta. Yeah, it's pretty much Delta based. And then we've got some rules. I'm not going to tell you what all the rules are, but, but basically you've, 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 you've at least heard the guideline of the rules from what I just said. And let's step back for a second, just to clarify for our listeners here. How did you arrive at that structure of 120 days for the put and then selling it out at 60? Was that purely done to minimize the impact of theta or was there something else going on there? Yeah, it is predominantly meant to it, it, uh, limit the impact of time value of theta, right? And so what we've done is we've just studied multiple windows, right? Uh, uh, like, like we didn't just – so part of it was experience, right? Many years of doing this. But then through those many years, we said, hey, let's test several years, several windows, right? Let's test 90 to 60. Let's test 120 to 60. Let's test 60 to 30. Let's test – you know, let's look at lots of different ways. Let's let's test 180 to 90. Let's test 180 to 120. Right. We tested lots of windows. But what we wanted more than anything was something that would be sensitive enough if the markets went down to provide protection. Right. Uh, but then also still survive for us some value that we can roll to the next hedge. And the most optimal window for us has turned out to be this, you know, uh, 120 to 60 day window. Now, Wayne, obviously, we're discussing some interesting ideas here. But of course, something like buying a put, it's not new. The way you're constructing is a little bit different, but it's not a new strategy yet. As you kind of outlined at the top of the show, there aren't that many funds or even managers out there utilizing really any sort of option structure in their funds. You have a handful of covered call funds. You have a handful of hedged equity. And that's really kind of about it. So why do you think even now, a decade after you wrote the book here in 2021, where options are more popular than ever. We saw volume last year that blew the doors off anyone's even wildest estimates out there. Why do you think even now in this environment, these types of funds and ETFs are still fairly rare? Yeah. So the, I think you hit on the first and most important one, which is options volumes have just taken off and the, and the adoption of options, right? Uh, as a, uh, as a vehicle by everyday investors has increased so much. With, uh, with all the people that came into the market uh, in 2020 and, and even in 2019. So, uh, so that is the first and foremost is people uh, used to look at options and they'd say, oh, I'm not touching that. That's risky or that's scary. But now more people understand them because of the increased use. And so they can hear this conversation you and I are having and words like theta and gamma and delta don't scare them. And so they're willing to actually entertain the use of that option uh, uh, on that basis. So that's that's the first part, right? That's, I think, one of the important parts. The second one is hedged equity strategies always come into favor after there are precipitous market declines. And, you know, the Russell 2000 at its low last year was down 45%. The S&P at its low was down 35%. That's, you know, two of the biggest declines we've had since, you know, what, the 2008 window, I guess, right? Uh, we've had some 20% declines here in, in you know, uh, in the last three to five, six years, but you know, I don't remember any 35s and 40s other than last year. And so whenever that happens, that's a reminder uh, to folks about what the market can do to you. And imagine you're nearing retirement. And if there's a huge market decline, you don't have the window, right, of earnings power ahead of you through work to make up for any decline in your portfolio you're planning to retire with. And therefore, hedged equity becomes a, a much more popular strategy for people who are nearing retirement. And let's face it, the people who are nearing retirement typically have the most assets, and so they have the most AUM that's available to managers like us. And so, therefore, these strategies have become more popular in those kind of windows. So it's a combination of education and client demand, you think, that's going to drive a lot more interest in the strategies going forward? Yes, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, though, Mark, this is the part that worries me a little bit is just wh wh while that's absolutely what's driving it, right? The hedged equity space, it, it, you know, we've done some deep analysis on all the existing players in that space. It has not delivered the promise that it, the, the, the benefits it has promised, right? And I, and I, and I say promise with quotes. I don't, you know, I don't think anyone's, no, no one's out there guaranteeing returns or certain, or certain uh, 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 sort of, you know, uh, growth in your portfolio. But 
But certainly when they describe a certain risk profile uh, and a certain sort of downside protection and upside capture, that the space hasn't done that great at capturing. And, you know, that's why we stepped in and said, man, we believe that this machine learning approach can solve this capture ratio issue and help people capture more of the upside of the market while still being protected. Now, you also raise another interesting point, which, as you kind of just mentioned, an aggressive downturn is effectively advertising for your segment of the market, right? People really get excited about a hedged equity type strategy when they see something like last March, where it wipes out a massive portion of their portfolio. Now, all of a sudden, that put is no longer a drag. It's a necessity. So does it concern you? You just launched this fund about a month ago. There is a potential we could linger in this kind of epic bull market for the foreseeable future here. Does that concern you that maybe might be a little bit of a hit on the AUM in the near term? Well, no, because again, I don't want people to have the wrong question. We're a net long strategy, right? Our ETF is 97% invested in equities and it's 3% invested in these options that are only meant to pay off if the market has a material decline. And so they tend to only represent a 25 to 30 delta drag on the portfolio, right? And we actually have done better than our delta. Like we've delivered a lower delta cost through our options than the delta at which we entered, right? Um, for the entire existence of our hedged equity strategy since 2017. And so as a result, that's why I told you earlier, our capture ratio of our managed accounts has been over 100% in our large cap hedged equity and over 100% in our mid and small cap hedged equity. I hope the market keeps going up. I even hope I'm fine if it moves sideways, right? If it moves down, I know I'll outperform, but I will lose money, right? I mean, that's the nature of hedged equity is you will still go down. You just won't go down as much as the market. We've been pretty good at capturing the upside. Right. Because of that alpha in our equity portfolio. So you said it earlier, Mark, I'm very dependent on creating that alpha in my equity portfolio. That's what any investor in our, in our ETF should know. And therefore, they should call me, get on the phone. Right. And, and better understand what we do before they make a decision to invest in our ETF. Interesting. So if you don't have that big, quote unquote, advertising event of a sell off, you think the outperformance to the upside will be enough to attract the folks to the ETF. Well, just imagine if you know you're invested in equities, but you have this downside built in and the, the guys you're invested with typically produce enough alpha to pay for the cost of the hedge and still produce equity like returns. But you know, you're at least sitting on that downside protection at all times. That's a pretty reassuring investment approach. And now, like I said, it requires us to create alpha from our equity selection to pay for that. So far, we've been good at it. Right. And hopefully we'll continue to be good at it. Hopefully our advantage of the alternative data and the machine learning will, will, will keep going the way they've gone for the last several years. Well, Wayne, that music means we've come to the end of our allotted time here on the old Options Insider radio program. But we always like to leave our audience wanting more, Wayne. So if folks are intrigued, maybe they want a hint of a tease of what's to come from you folks over there at Alpha DNA. Now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Yeah, so you definitely learn more about our ETF by going to advisorshares.com, right? Or sent.advisorshares.com. The ETF is the easiest way to get exposed to what we do. Or go to alphadnaim.com and you can set up a time with me or you can learn more about our strategies there. You know, hedged equity is definitely uh, a great exposure to a core part of your portfolio. Uh, and the ETF is a great way to get there. There you go. Check them out. The Alpha Shares. ETF here. And of course, we have a hedged equity sentiment ETF, ticker symbol just sent. You can look for it on all of your various platforms to search for. As you mentioned, advisorshares.com is the place to go as well. Wayne, this is fascinating discussion. We always love to look at different approaches to the hedged equity space. And you certainly have an interesting one here. We'll look forward to it and we'll look forward to seeing how it plays out in the marketplace in the coming months. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. And thanks to all of you out there for joining us today. Remember, a lot more than just interviews here on the network. Coming up tomorrow, we have Education Wednesday. You're getting a double dose of Options Boot Camp and Options Playbook Radio. Thursday, back to Episode 2 of the Option Block, as well as, of course, Twifle this week in Futures Options. Friday, no ball views this week, unfortunately, because we're off for the Good Friday holiday. But, of course, we're back again on Monday with the Option Block and the Crypto Rundown all the way through to Tuesday and another episode of Options Insider Radio. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. 
Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 